Hello. Welcome to day number three. Um, so today we're going to have a day of um, quantum chemistry by our senior research scientist, Nathan Fitzpatrick. Yeah. He's coming from the UK. Uh, he's a continuum. And uh, just to let you know, um, so pretty much today's morning schedule, like our lectures with 10 minute breaks. Then we're gonna have lunch here at 1.30. We have to take the shuttle or walk down to the lab again uh, at the Adratico uh, guest house. So at 2 p.m. we're gonna have uh, quantum chemistry labs today. So make sure everything is charged, uh, charging points down in the lab. But uh, without any further delay, let's uh, start our day on uh, quantum chemistry. Thank you. Hello. I guess I can have one here, I guess. Sounds good. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about quantum computational chemistry. I, I hope, you're in, hope you're looking forward to four hours of me lecturing today. <laughs> I, I am looking forward to it. So we, the idea is essentially to start from the ground, from ground zero, basically. So I imagine some of you are from a computer science background that haven't even done quantum chemistry before. And then hopefully, even for the physicists, this might be might be some new stuff, and hopefully try and give you some of the intuition behind quantum chemistry calculation, which I think kind of is quite mysterious to a lot of physicists. So why, why study chemistry? So at the basic level it is why do atoms stick together, which we, is known as the study of chemical reactions. So the, stu so in the, the study of chemical reactions essentially is the analysis of bond breaking and bond forming reactions. So you, can kind of, you, might, you may have seen these curly arrow drawings around, maybe giving you, giving you nightmares from your undergraduate, perhaps. Um, so these, these are extremely qualitative, and it kind of, it's kind of amazing that these work to describe chemical reactions so well. But you'll, uh, you'll see some of, some of just a simple analysis working from atomic orbitals gives you this picture. And it leads to a huge amount of chemical and biological complexity. So. It, Particularly, if you think, just think about the, the atomic orbitals, how, how they interact and the electron density, you can actually build up quite, quite a good picture of chemical bonding. But if we want to go a bit deeper, why study chemistry on computers? So we have, essentially, it's energy as a function of nuclear geometry. Okay. And we have this, this thing called the potential energy surface, where each, each point on this surface is a, is a quantum chemistry calculation. Like, well, it can be semi-empirical. Em the, the level of theory is up to you. It's your choice. Obviously, you'll get better results if you use a more advanced level of theory. Um, and you can see at the minimum, in, so these point A and C, these are what we call equilibrium geometries. This is where the, mo the molecule is stable. It likes to sit in these things. And these are, like the, these are, what, these are the re like kind of the relaxed geometries. But obviously, to, do it, to form a bond, we've got to go from A to C. We need to go by B. B is known as a transition state. That's where the bond breaking happens. So you can see, if we go along this reaction coordinate, where the reaction coordinate is this hydrogen. Oh, sorry. Is this hydrogen, this white thing being passed between the two oxygens. You can see it, it doesn't like being in the middle, so there's a high energy here. But obviously, to, to get from A to, a, from a to C by B, we need to increase the energy of the system. OK, so this is particularly important for biological processes and studying these accurately. Because if you look here, we have, for example, this is the oxidation of glucose. This is important for us to be alive. Um, and with, with an enz with, without an enzyme, this requires a lot more energies to kind of go from this equilibrium geometry of glucose to um, the carbon dioxide and water. So, like the, so ideally, we want to be able to understand why enzymes can reduce the, the, bar the, the, the energy barrier. Um, but obviously, the problem is that the enzymes, these biological systems, are huge, loads of degrees of freedom. Therefore, we can't really study all of the quantum, quantum interaction. So this is one of the motivations of quantum computing is it allows us to break the scaling problem because we can go for two to the n number of degrees of freedom. 
So t typically, the, our best results at the moment are kind of quite inaccurate for these strongly correlated systems. And the, the really famous one is, the, is FOMOCO in, in the nitrogenase. So the FOMOCO is, is this, the reactive center in the nitrogenase um, enzyme, which is found in the soil. It uses sunlight to convert uh, nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia, which is important for fertilizers. But we, we have to deal with the hard process, which uses 2% of the world's energy on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we can solve this, and this uh, if we can figure out why the, re the reaction barrier is so low for FOMOCO, we can save a huge amount of energy. Um, and this is kind of the poster child, this FOMOCO versus hard process is why we need quantum computing. Okay, so briefly I'll just talk about, so if the, the potential area surface is this kind of, when you go into high dimensions, so I showed you previously a two-dimensional one. Here we have kind of, this is a three-dimensional one, and it actually generalizes to three n minus six, because for every atom, you have three dimensions, with x, y, z, but then obviously you have translational, global translational and rotational, which remove six, six degrees of freedom from the problem. So obviously, so the, the minimum are those reactions and products and these saddle points of transition states. And you can do this in a nu numerically formally with kind of he Hessian analysis, where the Hessian is the, uh, the two-dimensional matrix of the second order derivatives. Um, and then, interestingly, the molecular properties come from the slopes and the curvature of the potential energy surface. For example, if you've got a very steep well, it's going to want to fall down to that um, equilibrium geometry very quickly, so there's a very, the reaction, it's, 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 uh, the force required for that reaction to happen is more. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we're not going to worry about potential energy surfaces, so moving on potential energy surfaces is what causes chemistry, but in order to, to get a good potential energy surface, we need to calculate the single energy point for, for a given geometry. And then for, for, for the rest of the talk, we're just going to be focusing on one grid point, because if you use kind of the cheap methods like DFT or semi-empirical, you'll get a potential energy surface, but it might not be the right one. So we need to get accurate potential energy surfaces, and to do that, we need to use very high-order methods like quantum computing or exact diagonalization, if you're familiar with that. Okay. Okay, so, so maybe I'm going to start kind of what you may have seen before. So just kind of want to inter introduce the quantum chemistry Hamiltonian. So the quantum chemistry Hamiltonian is the... Fully, interact, fully interacting fermion problem, where we have this, essentially we have these one body interactions and these two body interactions. And then we have these fermionic, and, fermionic creation annihilation operators, which um, I, I, I'll introduce later. But essentially, if you kind of squint, you can kind of see that it's like the Fermi Hubbard model, where rather than having nearest neighbor interactions, we have all possible global interactions. Okay, and then rather than having just these parameterized weightings for these interactions, these G and H, these are actually these spatially dependent objects which contain a huge amount of information and they actually res they're responsible. There's many, many years of development just to just find these parameters. So these parameters contain all the information of, so this shape here, this orbital, this is just one of these indexes here. So to get the all the information for PJ, PQ, RS, each individual indices, it contains, contains like the shape and the geometry of these molecular, these molecular orbitals. So I'm going to be speaking quite a lot through the first lecture and a half about basically just obtaining these molecular orbitals. Because if you start with a quantum, you can just start here in quantum computing if you want to be naive. You can just say, get, you may have used PyCF or some other driver but what's that, what's that, that, that gives you your, your quantum chemistry Hamiltonian, which you then give to a VQE or phase estimation or whatever. But it's like, what, what, ha, to actually get these weightings is a huge amount of work. And to actually understand the chemistry, you need to understand how you get the weightings of the interactions. OK, so we're going to speak about ba orbitals, basis sets, integral evaluation, and most importantly, Hotchie Fox theory. OK, so. So you, I'm going to start from the total basics. There may be people who haven't studied quantum mechanics at a high level here. 
like, there's, obviously there's lots of people who do threat of computer science in this field. So essentially, we're, gonna, we're only going to be worried about the time-independent Schrodinger equation because it, if it, most the, the, the quantum chemistry Hamiltonian is just dependent on, there's no time-independent terms. So we can just use this time-independent Schrodinger equation. And essentially, the time-independent Schrodinger equation all, will always have this form. You'll have a kinetic energy term and you'll have a potential term. And in three dimensions, the potential energy term is related to, is del squared. Sorry, the kinetic energy term is del squared. And this will always be the same. But the behavior of the system is, is encoded in the potential of the, of the Schrodinger equation. So depending on what application you have, you'll have a different V, and that will determine the overall wave function. The, the, uh, because this is essentially, this is a differential equation. So you can use, for, for a lot of the toy systems, you can, use diff you can use differential equation methods to solve for psi. And if you have different boundary conditions or terms in your Hamiltonian, you will end up with a different solution to differential equation. Okay. But the, the, the moral of the story is the Schrodinger equation really depends on the potential and the boundary conditions. So you may have seen it like this. This is, this is kind of what we call Hamiltonian eigen value of the Hamiltonian eigenvalue equation, where we group the, the operator terms. Um, so I should say this is, the, this is Planck's constant, h bar, and this is the mass of your particle. So this is, I'm just, we're just talking about a single electron here. I apologize. Yeah. Um, single particle. And then we can group all these terms. We, we, we kind of put them as this H operator here. And then the, that, that, will always, that, that will generate this kind of, it will generate the same, the same wave function, psi, and then this energy term, this energy weighting here. Okay, so, so, th so this is all, this, this is what we're trying to solve to get the wave function, given a potential and some boundary conditions. Okay, so Schrodinger, when he came up with his wave equation, which I think was in 1927, I think. He then released, I think, six different papers solving the time and penetrating equation um, using lots of very powerful differential equation methods, which had come from kind of Laplace and people like that looking at planetary motion and things like that. So even though these equations look extremely scary, there's a lot of kind of, the theory was quite well known by this point. So the, the, the ubiquitous one, which you probably all sold in your first year or second year physics course is the particle in the box. And it's the simplest example of how potential, 1D particle in the box, simplest, simple example of how potential and boundary conditions can govern the wave function. You can, and there's, there's some slightly more difficult ones, such as like the free particle in three dimensions. This introduces separation of variables and the idea of product wave functions. And then there's also the stationary hydrogen atoms. So this is the one that we're really going to focus on today. So I don't have time to really... So, so, so some of the exercises will be to solve these if you haven't before. But what we're really going to focus on today is the solutions of the hydrogen atom. Because that's where all chemistry can be built up from. Okay. Okay, so, the first, the, so the first kind of analytical solution of the Schrodinger equation is this quite simple model. Where you essentially have this 1D dimension and then you have these infinite potentials, and then you have zero potential between zero and L. Okay, so, and you can see the kinetic energy is kind of represented by this cool drawing that I made. Um, so, yeah, so, the Schrodinger, so the Schrodinger equation looks, looks like that. So it's kind of, it is a bit confusing because there's no potential in this form of the equation. So we have and this m here is the weight of the electron, or the particle which you choose. Um, but the, the particle is, is included in the boundary conditions of the solution. So one of the exercises will be to solve this. But essentially, the moral of the story is when you solve this equation, you end up with these quantized energy solutions, which are given by this, this, this parameter n. So the rest of these are constants, and l, obviously, as well. But given, given a fixed length of box and a fixed mass, N is, this, N is the only thing that can change. So what, what this represents is essentially is you get standing waves between these two potentials. 
and each standing wave has the, the, the harmonics. These have different energies. So this is really the first indication that Schrodinger showed that you get quantized energy from his Schrodinger equation. So the stationary hydrogen atom is really is, the, is kind of where kind of quantum chemistry really started, in my opinion. So here we have a single electron represented by m1, Ooh. and we have this kinetic energy operator del squared. And then we have this v. So this v is this spher this, is this spherical potential. Okay, so it's it's just a totally symmetric spherical potential. Okay, so you can see this now. So it's just one over. So we have yes, yeah, one over r squared, and this is the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron up here. Okay. So, so essentially, the, yeah. So the the, the 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 potential felt by an electron in the sphere will be dependent on a one over r term. Now you, you can try and solve this this problem in <coughs> in Cartesian coordinates, but it's not very natural because you have spherical potentials, right? So you can switch the polar coordinates, which looks terrifying, but as I said before, this is all quite well-known theory from kind of planetary motion and things like that. So essentially what you have here is rather than that x, y, z, you have what are called, you have the radial dependence, which is r, you have the theta, which is the equatorial angle, and then you have the azimuth, azimuthal, I think that's how you say it. Um, so you basically have rotations around the equator and rotations around the vertical axis. And the Schrodinger equation then, uh, the kinetic energy operator looks like this. And V is just equivalent to, to 1 over R. Yeah. So what, the, what, what this basically allows, so, so what this basically allows you to do, if you notice, you have three different terms in your kinetic energy operator. So again, don't try and solve this. This is all, all textbook stuff, but I'm just trying to give you the, the main ideas. So if you notice you have the R terms here, you have the theta terms here, and you have the, the phi terms here. Now, what this means is when you have a Hamiltonian like this, or any differential equation where you have non-interacting terms in the linear, because this is a linear, linear, uh, linear equation, it basically means that you can solve each one of these frequencies, one of these you can solve each variable on its own using a technique called separation of variables. And this is actually really important for hartree fock and a single electron wave function later on. But basically what it means is you can solve an independent system of equations. And then you can basically form the total system by having a product of that, of those independent systems, which is a very powerful method. So you can kind of see that here. So so if we say if we assume that we can have we have this pro, we can have this product wave function, which is dependent what which is you have a term for r, a term for theta, and a term for phi. We just substituted this into the previous equation. It looks a bit nasty because you've got this extra potential term, but you can do some rearranging, and you get this nice set. You can divide by the wave function, the product wave function, and you get this nice equation. And this can be this can be solved by a separation of variables. Now, this takes five chapters in most textbooks. So, if you if you are interested in looking into this, I highly recommend the book by Linus Pauling, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. It was written in 1937, but in my opinion, is the best is the best de description of how to solve the hydrogen atom. And it really gives you kind of the idea of how these problems are being solved back then before computers. A lot of the modern quantum chemistry textbooks are, you just jump into kind of the numerical solutions which give, don't give you as much insight into the problem. Okay, so here's the three equations that you get from separation of variables. You got your phi equation, you got your theta equation, and you got your radial, radial equation. Now these are all, now you can solve these using some quite, uh, quite an intense um, differential equations methods. But what, what this happened, so <laughs> I've jumped a lot of steps here, but more summary, 
you get this is the, this is a solution of that of that product equation. Okay. And as with the wave functions in the particle in the box solution, which which was quantized by some quantum numbers depending on the harmonics, here we have a similar idea where we have quantum numbers dependent on the radius. It's called the principal quantum number. We have the um, the, mag the magnetic quantum number, which is around the equator, uh, L, and then we have, sorry, that, so we have the angular momentum quantum number, which is around the equator, we have the magnetic quantum number, which is the azimuthal degree of freedom. So yeah, it, it's, it's quite scary, but as I said, like a lot of these polynomials, there's loads of work that happened here in the 1800s. And yeah, so, and the, the main tool they use is the spherical harmonics because obviously we have spherical symmetry and the potential of this makes, makes everything easier. Okay, so now you may notice that the energy when you solve this, because we have no electrons, extra electrons, you, the, there's, the, the, ener the energy is dependent on the, the even though the, the, the wave function contains n, l, and um, an m, it's quantum numbers. Because, because we, have non, we have a non-interacting single electron picture, the solutions of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, or this, the spherically symmetrical, particle and spherical, the particle and spherically symmetric potential, they only contain the, the principal quantum numbers. N here. Okay, so, so, that, so, I mean, this is so. Yeah, so it's if we want to go to larger atoms, larger ion, so like lithium, helium, beryllium, etc. This theory does break down a little bit because obviously we have interact. You need to take into account the interactions from from the inner electrons. It's called screening, if you've heard of that nuclear screening. So, but it's quantitatively, qualitatively, actually, actually, qualitatively, it still works quite well. So, you, so now you can kind of start to do some analysis with these wave functions, looking at the density, where the density is essentially is uh, psi squared. So the solution, I jumped ahead slightly. So if you, if you take that equation that you saw, that ter really scary equation that I showed you, and then you put in so this psi here, we have N, L, M. So that's the indexes. So principal quantum number. We have the principal quantum number one. There's only one. Then we have principal quantum number two. We have we have two. We have, well, we have the S orbital here, and then we have so that's two zero zero, and then we have the so anything with principal quantum number one. So N zero zero is known as an S orbital. Okay, so that's a totally symmetric solution. So you can see here we have psi one zero zero. This is just parameterized by this. You can see here this is just a radial distribution, radial exponential here. And it's an exponential parameterized by the radian, by the, ra the radius. So this is a spherically symmetric three D thing, or a sphere basically. And you can see the same applies. For the two s, but now you have kind of this, this, you have this product product here, which gives us nodal behavior. So if you see the two s, rather than being a sphere, is actually this kind of sphere, but with an inner sphere inside it as well. And the inner sphere comes from this product term before. And then you start when you start to have two one zero and two one one. You, uh, the, the, anything with L equals one, that's a P orbital, and that's when you get these dumbbell-like shapes here. Okay, but what, what I'm trying to show is that the shapes of the orbitals, all of the hydrogen orbitals, all come from the solutions of the, the spherically symmetric single particle wave function. Okay, so you can you can do some analysis on these with these things called the radial distribution functions. Now that the what the radial distribution function is essentially it's use Born's rule, 
which essentially is you take the density, you take the density of the of your wave function solutions, which is just essentially you take one. You basically you basically square the product of them. So here we're looking at the one s, which is this one zero zero. Remember this, this is the simplest one, which is just a spherically symmetric ball. Okay, it's just a, a exponentially decaying along the, along the radius symmetrically. You can see that we have. You can see that the and there's obviously from when it starts decaying when you get away from the nucleus as well. So you can see here that if we if we take the, if we analyze this along along the radius, you can see that the probability of finding an electron kind of has this distribution function. And then you, this is the, the 2s, which is equally symmetric, has this, fun, has this function. But you have this nodal character here. So the principal quantum numbers all have these. I just go up in principal quantum number, you get an extra node in your wave function, which in the s orbital picture is a ball within a ball within a ball, if that makes sense. Okay. But the main point to take is that the hydrogen atom gives you the sh kind of the shape of where the electrons like to sit. So the solutions of the hydrogen atom give you the, give you the rough, that were the best approximate of how the electrons like to behave in large molecular systems. So this is really where you need to start to do quantum chemistry. So having a good understanding of these molecular orbital, or these, these atomic orbital shapes, really like gives you some intuition in chemistry. This, this is, if you, if you think about a lab chemist, they're always thinking about the shape, these, these shapes and how they can fit together, things like that. So this, this is really, really where the chemical intuition co comes from. Okay, and th this was actually um, experimentally verified in 2013. Um, you think you're using X-ray diffraction, I think. Um, and you can see that 90 years after the Schrodinger derived the equations, only about ten, only nine years ago, they actually were able to verify this. So these are the excited hydrogen um, X-ray diffraction, I think, which is really cool. So, it, so essentially, in the presence of no extra electron, so the single electron picture of the hydrogen atom is essentially correct with that, because, because there's no relativistic effects or anything like that. Okay, so, and what's, what's very, very interesting is that these, the solutions of the hydrogen atom, they predict these, these, the structure of these orbitals. It turns out that the, 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 periodic, the periodic table structure, which was determined before the solutions of the hydrogen atom, is grouped into essentially S, P, uh, D, and F orbitals, which are essentially the, the N, L, M solutions of the Schrodinger equation. So, so, so Schrodinger actually essentially verified the structure of the periodic table determined by Mendeley and Leyev. So you can see here, you have, we have going down in principal quantum number, you have n1, 2, 3, 4. This block here is called the S block. These are all the spherically symmetric, these, these, are, all the, these are all the outer electrons in the spherically symmetric. So yeah, the, the periodic table is structured on the valence electrons, which is the outermost electrons. And then the, electro, the electrons in this block are known as the, so the, so the, the orbitals in this block, this block in periodic table is known as the S block because the outer electrons are all in S orbitals. And then this block here is known as the P block. And their outer electrons are all in these P orbitals, which are these dumbbell-like shaped ones. If I go back. Yeah, so the S orbitals, the S orbitals are these ones, and these are the P orbitals here. So to, to the, that's one P orbital. I don't know, who, who, who made this figure? <laughs> so this is this is one P orbital is dumbbell. This is another P orbital is dumbbell. Another P orbital is dumbbell. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, so and then and then you, in the middle you get these what are called the deal orbitals, and essentially these are grouped into kind of these these all all the all the blocks have the same principal the same outer electrons have have outer electrons in the same in a spin orbit in in an orbital which has the same quantum number solutions as a hydrogen atom, which is very cool. And then you got the the lamp and nice and the nice down here, which is the f orbitals. Okay. So and you can kind of see this with so you kind of so you, the, the, what this is showing is this now this is rather than taking a qualitative approach, this is kind of the quantitative analysis of this. So this is the this is the ionization energy, experimental ionization energy. So what this is showing is the energy it takes to take your most outer electron and and re remove it. So that's so that's kind of telling you the energy of your 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 orbital. Um, your, your last field orbital, and you can you can see that the, like it's, it's quite good. Like so, you you can see here this is h to h e. This is the first principal quantum number, and that just goes up monotonically. And then l to l to neon. This is the second principal quantum number, and then we have the third principal quantum number. And then things start to get a bit confusing when we have the d orbitals. And then we have the f orbitals. But you can see the blocks do monotonically increase, which is kind of what is what is expected from from the solution to the hydrogen atom. But the the problem is when we start to introduce um, electronic electron when, when we start to in, include the electronic interactions of the sh of the inner electrons, then the the, the the theory kind of breaks down. But it's still like to a quantitative level. But they're, they're rough, roughly qualitatively correct. And it's basically due to as you increase the potential as you go up the, the group for the same quantum number. Because obviously as you go along the group, you're adding more more protons to the nucleus. So your the attraction of electrons to the the protons increases, so it requires more energy to ionize them. But obviously this, this whole approximation that we've spoken about so far neglects electronic electronic interactions. And of course, it, the relativistic effects for the lanthanides. So, like for example, gold would not be gold if we didn't include the relativistic interactions, because the, the the core orbitals travel at near the speed of light. Yeah. Okay. So, this, so, so, so this is kind of what you. What, this is what is really seen. You might have seen this in your chemistry classes at A level. So, if the, the solutions that we just derived before, these would have, for all the things with two, these would be the same, same level, and then all the things with three would be the same level. But obviously, what happens is, that because the, because the, the p orbitals are in these dumbbell shapes and they're more diffuse, when you start to include the core electrons, the p orbitals and, and, and yeah, this is slightly confusing. So ionization is up here. So this is more energy to ionize here. So yeah, so this is larger energy gap. So obviously the p orbitals are less strongly bound to the nucleus because they they interact less strongly with the inner electrons. Um, and this is what is called shielding. So the p orbitals are shielded less. Or, sorry, shielded more. Wait, yes. So the, the, the p orbitals feel the effects of the, are repelled by the nucleus. Sorry, they're repelled by the inner electrons more. And that's why the ionization energy is lower. But, so, okay, so to solve this, we need, we need to include these, these electronic electronic interactions. Okay. And this, this is where Hartree-Fock theory and all the motivation for Hartree-Fock comes in. So obviously in molecular energies, we have all of these. We have, there's lots of terms in the Hamiltonian which are neglected. So you have vibrational, rotational, and nuclear spins. These all decrease in value. And we essentially neglect, and there's translation as well. Um, we basically neglect all of these and just focus on the electronic. 
which one I couldn't do. OK, so now we're starting to think about molecules. OK. So we have, so, so now we have, this is, this is the, all, these are all the terms from the molecular, for the molecular electronic Hamiltonian, just for the electronic energy. So we have here, the, so I hope you like my drawing. <laughs> it's color coded. So we have the kinetic energy operator of the electrons. So we're assuming, what we're, we're, I must say, we're using the Born Oppenheim approximation here. So we're assuming that the nuclei are fixed in position. And then the electrons are just whizzing around these fixed nuclear positions. And the, so you can see the kinetic energy is represented by the yellow. And then we have the, the, nucle, the nuclear electron interaction is represented by green. You can see this is a Coulombic term, which is 1 over r. Oh, that should be, yeah, should that be squared? Yes, that should be squared, I apologize. Um, um, so you, as you, as you can see here we have, this is the mass of the electron times by the electronic mass times the number of protons in the nucleus, which is Z. And then obviously R, I, A is the distance between, is, it, is the distance between, so is the, is the distance interact, is the distance between the nuclei and the electron. And then we have this red term, which is this kind of instant, this is a two body electronic interaction term. And these are, because these are moving electrons, this is not, you can't solve this term like very easily. It's, 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 there's actually not, it's a, two, it's a three body problem. So it becomes very difficult. And then you have this, th this fourth term, which is the, um, which is the electronic, the nuclear nuclear interactions. But we tend to remove that because the nuclei are fixed, so they're not going to change over that. So you can, do, so you can actually just calculate that and add it in at the end. So the problem that we're trying to solve with the electronic Hamilton is actually this one. Um, yeah, this, sh this should be squared. I apologize. These R's here. This is Coulomb interaction. Sorry. Um, so the charge-charge interaction. So, so now we have these three terms in the electronic Hamilton, molecular electronic Hamilton. We have. The, the, you have the coulombic interaction of the positive nucleus and the negative electron. We have the kinetic energy of the moving electrons. And then we have the electronic electronic interaction. So these are what are really difficult to solve. Um, and actually, most of modern quantum chemistry is actually trying to solve this term rather than this term. Um, so it turns out, if you notice, the, the nuclei yeah, because the nuclei are fixed in position, they're, they're not variable. So it turns out that we have a single electron term here and a single electron term here. And what that means is we basically have a non-interacting set of terms in the first part of the equation. OK, so, 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 this, so this can be solved with this, this product type approach, where you have, well, you, separable, when you have a separable differential equation, you can obviously use separation of variables and solve the individual term each time. So, and then this term is not separable, obviously, because you have these electron-electron cross terms. Uh, and it's essentially because the instantaneous positions are affected by each other. So this is, this is incredibly, yeah, so, so what we do is we just get rid of it <laughs> as an initial, initial qualitative uh, approximation. So, and, and then this is called the linear combination of atomic orbitals Hamiltonian. Okay. And it, we, we literally just have the kinetic energy of the electron and then the kind of the electronic interaction, 
the, the, we have the coulomb contraction with the electron and the nuclei. So you can, you can see the sums in this simple picture. Yeah, so you have these four sums here, which is represented by the arrows. And then we have two terms for kinetic energy. Okay. All right, so now we've got the separable, separable differential equation or separable, separable, separable linear operator. So it means that we can use separation of variables and we can solve the global molecular picture with a single electronic product wave function. Okay. But so the, the way we go about this is we use, we suggest, we use this, the, the first idea is to try and solve this molecular problem with this very simplified Hamiltonian that we've picked is we use, we use the solutions of the hydrogen atom, hydrogen-like atom. Um, so these, these, these shapes, these orbital shapes. We use those as a basis um, for, our, for this Hamiltonian. OK. So and, and I must say, so there's something called the Pauli exclusion principle, which essentially means that the solutions of the, the, Schrodinger, the hydrogen atom that I showed you before they have space for two electrons. And that's because you can have, basically have no repeating quantum number. But there is a quantum number that I ignored, which is called spin. Spin's a fundamental property of the universe. It was discovered by Jordan. And it has this S2 symmetry. Um, but what we basically have here is we have what is called a spin orbital. So this is really important. You might have heard this. You might have heard this from. You might have heard this like from your lecture or something like that. So what spin orbital is essentially is you have this psi here. The psi is the spatial orbital wave function. The spatial orbital is, the, is that hydrogen atom thing, the shape. But then that's got space with two electrons. And then the individual electronic wave function is called the spin orbital. And it has two variables. We have r, which is the distance. And then we have. Um, sigma, which is a discrete spin variable, and they typically represent a spin half or minus spin half. And we often group them together into this thing called the position spin variable, called x. OK, so that's, uh, that's what it means. OK. Um, so, OK, so we then. Yeah, so, in, in, so, so we take the Hamiltonian and then we solve it in the single electron picture. And that's the single spin orbital picture. Okay? So we take one term from that, ham one, basically one of those Hamiltonians for each electron. And then that's totally valid to then just solve it for each one and then form a total molecular wave function and add them together. And then we use what we, we use as. The linear combination of atomic orbitals, as you can tell by the name, we form a molecular orbital from a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Okay. So you can see here that we have a sum over atomic orbitals, weighted, which is these spin orbital-like things that I just showed you before. And then we have this, this linear weighting on each, for, each, for, each spatial, for each spin orbital. Um, it's a bad quantitative picture, but this is actually an adequate way of getting kind of qualitative results in the lab. Um, and motivate all the arrow pushing that you see before. So let's consider the simplest molecular system now. Okay, so we're doing chemistry finally. So we've got two hydrogens interacting. And then we say we've got these, we, we, we take the simplest single electron solution. And due to symmetry arguments, you can just isolate all the s orbitals. Don't, don't ask me about that. But, but it's to do with group theory if you're interested. Well, please do ask me about that, actually. That's my favorite topic. But, um, you, so basically, you can isolate the s orbitals due to symmetry arguments. 
and then you can solve this like this. You can solve the interaction. So you basically say the, the two s orbitals on each hydrogen. You say you, you let them interact, and these are spin orbitals. So there's a single electron. So you have the spatial orbital, which is the s orbital, and the only one spin occupation on each side. And you solve it. But now you've introduced this basis. When we, when we apply this basis to the Hamiltonian that we showed, you get what's called the secular equation. Now I don't have time to derive this in this equation in this lecture, but essentially, when you solve, when you have a Hamiltonian, you introduce a basis. You will always form a not a complex optimization problem, and that's due to what's known as the Rowley-Ritz variational principle. And there's an exercise in the, in the things to solve this. What that gives you basically is that whenever you solve this, you get a, 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 from, from the Rowley Rotation principle, you solve it for a minimum. This equation drops out. And what this equation shows is that this, the solution of this eigenvalue equation will always be the global minimum for this basis, which is extremely powerful. So you see this in all of quantum chemistry and all of kind of exact diagonalization methods, things like that. And this is kind of really fundamental. Says so that the secular equation and the variational principle are two of the founding properties, principles of quantum chemistry. Okay, so what does this look like from a mathematical setting? So we, we have the, so the, we, we saw we had, sorry, I should get back. So this H, this H here is called the Hamiltonian matrix. And now we've got this, this non orthogonal basis. Now, the, the, obviously, the atomic orbitals are orthogonal in space, but bear in mind we're not in this, they're not on the same, they're not in the same point in space, so they're not actually orthogonal wave functions. And then you have this overlap matrix which counts for some orthogonality, so this is a generalized eigenwave problem now. So what do these elements look like? So, so a lot of quantum chemistry really comes down to solving these Hamiltonian elements. Now this is one of the because we're working in that kind of a first quantization picture here, you notice that the, the, their functions are distance, the wave functions, which is not actually the case in now second quantization, but it gives you an idea of how you build up these, these elements. So there's a whole field of first quantization in quantum, quantum computing, but you basically what you, what you see here is you have the wave function on each side. So you've got this, you, you, may, you see you've got your wave function, you've got your operator, and then you've got your wave function on the right side integrated over all of space. Now the operator, you can see here, this is the, if we just take the S orbitals, we showed that these come from the radial solutions, radial symmetric solutions of the Schrodinger equation on both sides. And then we have, they're kind of sandwiched by this, the sandwich, you have this operator which is sandwiched by both of them. And you can see the operator now has, we've got the kinetic energy term, Remember, this is, remember, we're in a single electron picture here. So we have the kinetic energy of one electron. And then we have the kinetic energy of the one electron interacting with the, the nuclei on the first hydrogen and the second hydrogen. OK. OK, so this, this is a pretty nasty equation, but you can actually solve this with kind of scipy dot integrate or something like that. Um, I think it would be really cool to actually write, to, to want to write a, if someone wanted to write a the solver for this, for the s orbitals. So just, you, you can see that you can just plug this in. These are all functions that you can integrate. You just need to discretize some numeric grid over bit the radius, the radial function. Okay, and then we have the overlap matrix. And I think the overlap matrix have kind of a intuitive picture because it's literally in this first quantizational picture where you have that when the wave functions are distance dependent, you get, well, that's probably the wrong, the wave function is always distance dependent, but in first quantization, the, radio, the, distance, the distance dependence lives on the wave function rather than the operator, like in second quantization. But anyway, you get this kind of physical overlap picture where you have these kind of exponentially decaying functions on the nuclear cusp. And, and you can see that yeah, the, over, the overlap will increase with how much they physically overlap. Okay, so I'll just quickly 
I'll do a few more slides and I'll stop. So, I should work. Okay, so, so, th so this is kind of what we not, you can use this. So if you notice that equation was an eigenvalue equation, so it turns, and then we had two basis functions. So that means there'll be two solutions with, of the S orbitals and hydrogen. We have, so it, we solve for the one electron picture, and then we fill it up with two electrons, because we get one, one solution for one electron and one solution for the other electron. But they're the same due to the spatial orbitals being the same. So, but basically, you have two interacting hydrogen atoms, and then you get what's called a bonding orbital, Mole bonding molecular orbital, this is super important now. And then you have an anti-bonding molecular orbital. So we take this, the two spin orbitals, and we form a molecular orbital. Now, it's quite confusing because you get two molecular orbitals down here, one for the spin up and one for the spin down, and two molecular orbitals. Uh, up here for this, but these are vacant. But the, this, what we call the sigma G, this is the bonding orbital, and this is kind of a positive linear combination of two SL orbitals. And then you get the sigma U star, stands for Gerardo and Ungerardo, I think, which is German for spherically symmetric. Uh, <coughs> symmetric, uh, symmetric across the center inversion, I think. And anti symmetric. And you get this negative combination here. So, the, so this is really kind of what you, you get this bonding and anti bonding picture. Um, and it's not normally this simple when you have lots more electron, lots more spin orbitals. But in the kind of the two, uh, two, uh, two spin orbital system, it's quite nice to see that you get bonding and anti bonding. So what this is showing, just to summarize, you're joining up these two, and then you form these two here. OK. And then you can kind of look at the Born rule now, the densities for this new molecular orbital picture. OK. So if you look at the, the bonding orbital here, so you, you can multiply this out into the two spin S orbitals if you wanted to. But what you see is the Born rule, you get these kind of, this peaky, the two, two S orbitals are really these peaked nuclear cu cusps. And you get the bonding interaction here, which is like this favorable density in the center of the bonding orbital. And that's why you get this joined electron cloud. And these are all just mathematical solutions. And then you have the anti-bonding, which is obviously the neg you have a positive and negative interaction here of the same function. And then that's where you get this nasty function here of the wave function. But obviously, when you take the Born rule, you're squaring it. So then you get this unfavorable like, area in the center where the electrons are like, ooh, get away from me. Um, and th and th so that's why you get this, that's why you see this anti-bonding. And that's why you have the positive and the ne negative colors here. So these are called the phases. Okay. I'll just go, yeah. So the, so the summary is you can build up a molecular bonding, a very simple molecular bonding picture with the hydrogen-like atomic orbital. So you get the, but, and it, the simplest idea, you don't even have to think about the mass, really. It basically what it boils down to, if they have the same shape and they're overlapping of the same color, there will be a favorable interaction. So this is where the chemists get so much of that chemical intuition from, is that they're kind of implicitly solving the linear combination of atomic orbitals in their head by kind of like overlaps with like favorably. And that's why you get this bonding picture. So here you have the two S orbitals bonding to form, the, favorably interacting to form this, this sigma bond. We call the sigma bond because it's has totally it's totally spherically symmetric, circularly symmetric around the bonding axis. And then, you have, and then when you have two two favorably interacting p orbitals, you get this kind of delocalized. You get the, the positive phase delocalizing at the top favorably, and the positive phase delocalizing favorably at the bottom. So you get like this two, two sausages almost, above and below the, but below the, the bonding axis. And if you, this has kind of 180 degree symmetry. Okay. Um, 
and this, this all comes from, if you're interested in group theory, this, all these, all, these labels all come from point group symmetry um, for the irreducible representations of the finite groups. And then, yeah, so you can see now, now if you start want to go to, you can obviously add all the, all the, there's infinite number of solutions for the hydrogen atom, right? So you can start to form all these bonding pictures of two hydrogen atoms. So you, you can kind of see, it's quite intuitive. You just have favorable interaction, non-favorable, favorable, non-favorable, non for the same shape. Then the p orbitals, they're all the same, but they're on different axes, so they can actually spatially interact slightly differently. So you get sigma bonding p's here, pi, orbit, pi bonding p's, anti-bonding pi p's, and sigma an, anti-bonding sigma p, sigma p bonds, so sigma p orbitals. Um, and you can kind of see the p orbitals interact less strongly than the, so the, the pi bonds are less strong than the sigma bonds because they have less physical overlap. And that actually, that actually comes from the overlap term in the secular equation having less magnitude for, the, for these two combinations. So yeah, so this is, this is the chemical intuition that people sort of have. And it's basically just orbital overlap. That's all you think about. So benzene is these six carbon atoms. You know carbon is in the P block. It's got these, these, these PZs, we call them. So you have PX, PY, and PZ. Now all the PZs from the carbons, in, you have six of them. So this would be a six-dimensional basis, right? One PZ for each carbon atom. And then you get these favorable interactions here. And this is, these are the, this is the pi, pi bonding interactions of benzene. So you get this delocalized cloud. And then you can kind of, this is really cool, because if you start to think about like graphene, you can see why you have all this delocalization property of graphene, because the electron clouds are all delocalized. Like they're basically, it's basically extrapolation of this to like tessellations of these carbons. OK, I'm going to stop there for now. Any questions? Let me know. Okay, do we have a quick question or? Yeah, okay. All right, maybe it's a bit early, but I need help building my chemical intuition. So if we look at the uh, diagrams of the atomic orbitals, yeah. right, where you have light and dark yeah. patches, if I want to make them fit together, should I be trying to put Light on top of light, or light on top of dark. You want you want them to overlap with the same colours. So if I get back, I mean you kind of see it here actually. Um, so if you look at this, this is a very strong. So we have the this is the most strongly bonding because we have on, uh, vertically we have four six of the same colour interacting, and, and then you have the, the negative phase, six of the same colour interacting on the bottom. Then you can see them. They're now the, the energy of the bond is less strong here because you start to have there's more mixing. You see up here, you got one positive, one negative, two positive, two negative, etc. And then you can see up here is the most weakly bonding, this is the strongestly anti-bonding. This is because you have totally out of phase things. So it's, it, it, if you have more more things of the different colours touching, that's bad, basically. Yeah. And then, so I noticed when you were doing the ionization energies of various elements, yeah. indium and gallium have really low ionization energies. Does this have something to do with why they're used in 3-5 semiconductors? I am not an expert in kinetic matter, but... Oh. So the, the, I believe that's to do with the fact that they form... 2D materials like graphene, gallium, arsenic, things that, that's why, because it's a fabrication, it's easy. Ah, okay. Um, but the, the, the re gallium is the, I mean, so let's go to the period, I don't have the period table in my head. It's been a long time since I've actually done chemistry <laughs> properly. So ga where's gallium? Go and help me. Uh, to the right, one column, and there yeah, it is. Okay, so, so it's the first P orbital. So it's, you've changed your quantum number, and then the p orbitals is the first one. So that's why it's at the bottom. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's why it's lower. I'm OK, sure. so one electron has just been pushed up into an orbital, yeah. and it's yeah. easy to peel that electron off. Yes, exactly, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, one quick question. You, you can see here, actually, Ben, you can see it's the first P block, because you can see the start of the P block ionization. So the six P orbitals you've got. So gallium's the first one, okay. and you've got the rest that's a crypt. Yeah. And then when you have more nuclei, you've got obviously strongest potential interaction. So it's like the nuclei holds onto the electrons much more. Yeah. OK, um, sorry. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, uh, in the linear combination of atomic orbitals, uh, there was a section equation, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you have four parameters are uh, for uh, uh, variable c, right? Can you just add up all like all possible linear uh, like uh, atomic orbitals and make a linear combination of them? And I don't know by brute force or machine learning, just like go up to as much as you can yeah, and learn yeah, everything. Yeah. You like, could you, just have. All of them, if you wanted to, yeah, and, and would, then solve it. Uh, yeah. And would there be any like significance to it, or, or that, like you, you what's will, the implications? You'll, you'll see the symmetry if you just were naively to throw all the spatial orbitals. You will see, and if you're to machine learn it, you will see them group into switch symmetry objects. Um, so you'll see this how much will get blocked into symmetry groups, okay. so irreducible representations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I imagine the machine learning, if you were to throw it, all of them at, mm -hmm. all the orbitals at it, it will just find the, the physical symmetries present in your problem. And that will be represented by the blocks of this Hamiltonian, which will then result in kind of, you'll have eigenvectors which have a lot of zeros, which don't allow for interaction as other thing. Okay, good. So let's have a very quick break. Thank our speaker for the first hour. We'll be back um, soon, okay? <laughs>